glimpse of the other stuff. <laughs> thanks, Rob. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone. It's uh, good to be here. It's good to be back at um, Howick Rotary again. I think this is, uh, might be my third time, actually, um, at Howick Rotary. But uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And, uh, Jeff, congratulations on your, uh, your presidency. I'm sure it will be um, an excellent uh, year for you all. Uh, thanks, Rob, for the introduction. You, you always worry a little bit when people uh, are introducing you because you never know what they're going to say. I personally am not a fan of the whole baby of the house thing because, one, because <laughs> it means you're the youngest MP and you get picked on a bit, but two, when you look at someone like me, you think more baby elephant than baby of the house or, or anything like that. Um, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Rob. And uh, Madeline, great to see you uh, here again. Um, you're such a good public speaker. I hear there's a vacancy next door for me. Um, so if you're looking for a job in your retirement, you know, there's there's a vacancy. Oh, yes. Williamson, Madeline East, got a There we go. There we go. Um, so it'll be good. <laughs> um, when I first spoke to Jeff, uh, it was about three months ago now, about coming along and speaking at um, Howard Rotary, we um, were discussing the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's uh, possibly lost uh, a little bit of its uh, interest uh, from the media and from the activists and protesters um, since we uh, first chatted about it, Jeff, but I thought it'd be a good idea to just run you through um, why New Zealand's pursuing this trade agreement, uh, why we believe it's so important for New Zealand, um, try and dispel some of the myths that you've probably heard about TPP and then as Rob mentioned I, I have been overseas recently so I've got a few travel pics at the end that I can show you and I'm happy to discuss um, anything about American politics that we've, we've observed uh, as well. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership these are the countries that make up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, 12 countries. Um, New Zealand is uh, actually the country that started uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, this will come as a surprise to those that watch the 6 o'clock news because um, the activists and protesters all believe it was started by the, the big bad United States. They were actually one of the um, last countries to join um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but effectively started with New Zealand uh, and four other countries um, when we started the P4 uh, agreement. Um, that was in the mid-2000s. Um, that got quite a lot of uh, support and legs around the other countries around the Pacific Rim and eventually they all came together and said, hey, why don't we um, negotiate a, an agreement uh, amongst 12 countries to try and get an agreement across a range of countries where we um, standardise the trade agreements uh, and the trade rules um, amongst those countries. And so hence, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership was negotiated. Uh, it was signed um, only recently. Uh, it was only concluded after many, many years of negotiations and signed uh, earlier this year. Why do we pursue free trade agreements? And this is a question I want to start off with because it's not always clear um, to people um, why we pursue um, free trade agreements. It basically comes down to the fact that we're a relatively small country um, near the bottom of the Pacific. Um, we aren't going to get rich by selling um, goods and services between ourselves as New Zealanders and we need to um, expand uh, our opportunities and export to other countries uh, around the world. I would hope that this is just um, normal normal uh, orthodox uh, processes that countries should go through. It's not necessarily um, seen as the norm for a number of people do for many, many um, decades. Um, through free trade agreements, we've been able to and expand our exports um, to other countries. When we export more goods to other countries, more money comes into New Zealand, um, our country gets wealthier as a result, and overall our incomes increase, our economy grows faster, and we benefit more as a country and we create more jobs. That's basically why we pursue free trade agreements, and we've got a good track record as a country uh, uh, as, uh, of pursuing them. <clears throat> There's supposed to be a pie graph there that hasn't popped up, unfortunately. Um, I'm not sure why, but the pie graph, uh, if it was there, would show you that about three quarters of all of our exports at the moment are covered by free trade agreements that are already in place, or TPP, or the EU um, free trade agreement that we're pursuing. Um, our goal as a nation, our goal as a government, is to get as much of our export industry and, and countries we export goods to um, into free trade agreements, because that lowers the barriers to trade, it reduces the cost for people to export goods overseas, uh, and uh, that is beneficial for our exporters in New Zealand. This slide without the pie graph is a waste of time though. But <clears throat> what I want to show you with this particular 
set of numbers is just evidence that free trade agreements for New Zealand uh, benefit us. And what these numbers show you is that under um, these, I've picked out four uh, free trade agreements um, that we have, they show you that with a good comprehensive free trade agreement we can increase our exports at a considerable rate. So under the China free trade agreement, once it was signed in 2008, our exports um, on a compound annual growth rate have increased by 20% on average every year since that free trade agreement was signed. That's a huge increase in exports that we've seen after that free trade agreement was signed. Um, <clears throat> it's happened with uh, a number of other countries too. Um, in fact, just about every free trade agreement we've signed has seen exports increase as a result of lowering those barriers to trade. And um, with Vietnam, we've seen an eight annual um, compound annual growth rate of 8.5%, eight Australia, uh, even though it was signed way back in 1983, we've seen an average annual growth rate of 6.5% since 1983. Singapore is a similar story. When you compare the growth rates in exports with countries where we have a free trade agreement with countries where we do not have a free trade agreement, they're only growing on average at half a percent uh, every year or that's been the case for the past 15 years. So if you compare growth rates in exports of sort of 20%, 8%, 5% compared to half a percent, it's very clear to us that with free trade agreements where we reduce those barriers to trade, where we reduce tariffs that our exporters have to pay, we see more exports um, being sold and that's beneficial um, for New Zealand. So why is TPP um, so important to us and, and why, despite all the opposition and the protests, are we continuing to pursue it? Well, basically it comes down to the fact that a third of the world's GDP is in TPP nations. Of those 12 countries that make up TPP, a third of the world's GDP is in there. Um, Helen Clark made a very good point a couple of years ago when she said um, New Zealand just can't be excluded from a trade grouping that's moving in a particular direction. We need to keep up with the pack, we need to be part of it, with a third of the world's GDP going through TPP countries being excluded from that trade agreement would see us miss out um, considerably. 40% of our own goods exports um, go into TPP countries. Um, $20 billion of goods get exported to TPP countries right now. We hope to grow that considerably. And $8 billion of service exports um, go through TPP countries as well. We also see considerable um, foreign investment um, coming into New Zealand from TPP countries uh, and that's beneficial for New Zealand as well. When countries invest in New Zealand, um, that's more money coming into our economy, more money floating around, which leads to greater economic growth. Here's a look at, um, if you can see those numbers from the back of the room, how our exports of goods and services break down under, under um, TPP countries at the moment. Um, with $20 billion of goods exports, we export currently $2.7 billion of meat, $4 billion of dairy, $7.5 billion of manufactured goods. Uh, on the tourism, on the services side, $3 billion worth of tourism exports, so $1.5 billion worth of transport exports. There's huge numbers of exports going through um, those countries uh, that are part of TPP, a number of which we don't currently have free trade agreements with, and we're paying a lot of money to try and get our goods in there. TPP reduces um, the cost to exporting those goods to TPP countries. It also um, <clears throat> includes, as well as the $28 billion that I mentioned as the high level figure for all the countries in TPP, um, $8.7 billion worth of goods are to new free trade agreement partners under TPP. So what that means is $8.5 billion of our goods currently are going to countries, namely the USA, Japan, Canada, Mexico and Peru, where we don't currently have a free trade agreement with. These are new partners, these are new countries where we um, currently are paying high trade tariffs compared to other countries um, that do have free trade agreements with those nations. And if we can reduce the costs of exporting that $8.5 billion worth of goods, um, that's going to be beneficial. New Zealand governments for many, many years have been pursuing a trade agreement with the USA and with Japan. Those are the two big um, countries there that we've wanted to get um, our, our goods through the door of um, with a trade agreement. 
even if every other country was excluded from TPP, with the USA and Japan as part of TPP, it makes it all worthwhile and all beneficial for New Zealand because we just do so much um, trade um, with those countries. Um, this graph here shows you the amount of trade we do with countries um, that are TPP um, nations and uh, all of our trade, in fact, um, uh, uh, on this graph. Once TPP is fully ratified and implemented, and once we've concluded an agreement with the European Union, every single one of our top 10 trading partners uh, we will have a free trade agreement with. Right now, uh, China is our largest goods export market. Um, Australia we do more trade with, but when you look at it on a goods only basis, we do more trade with China than we do with any other nation. That's because it's grown so fast since the 2008 free trade agreement. But um, China, Australia, uh, the US, Japan and South Korea, just to name those big ones there, um, once we have TPP in place, we will cover just about all of them except the European Union. But as I mentioned, um, we're working on the European Union. Another reason why we can't be excluded um, from TPP. So what are the benefits and what are the costs uh, of TPP? Well, the benefits for New Zealand are that we save a quarter of a billion dollars in tariffs every year that we're currently paying. So for all of the exports going to TPP nations right now, um, New Zealand exporters will save a quarter of a billion dollars once it's fully implemented. We're expecting, based on the modelling that's been done by, by our Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, that it will be worth $2.7 billion a year in additional GDP growth um, to New Zealand. We're also expecting that 95% of um, all tariffs um, with new free trade agreement partners under TPP will be cut. But more importantly, it levels the playing field um, for exporters. So Australia right now um, has a free trade agreement with the United States. Um, we do not have a free trade agreement with the United States. If we're exporting um, two products that Australia exports and we export, let's say it's beef for example, when we export it, we pay more than Australia does um, under um, uh, their Australian US free trade agreement. Our beef is better quality, our beef is more desirable than Australian beef, but they can get it into the United States cheaper than us because they have a free trade agreement, we do not. TPP would level the playing field um, on that basis. What are the costs to TPP though? Because if you listen to the media and the protesters, you would think that TPP is a, a terrible agreement which is going to cost us considerably as a nation. Well, the biggest cost under TPP is extension of copyright. We're out of line um, with copyright uh, around the world. Um, we're about 20 years behind what many other nations do um, with copyright. Um, we extend copyright um, 50 years past the uh, lifetime of the author. Um, that is going to be moved to 70 years uh, under TPP. Is that a cost to New Zealand? Yes, over a long period of time you will pay a little bit more if you buy CDs or if you buy books that are still within the copyright period and that's estimated to cost the whole country $55 million a year but on an individual basis that's going to be um, relatively small. Um, you already would typically pay copyright um, for goods and, goods and services that you're purchasing um, if they're still within the copyright um, period. The other cost to New Zealand is there's going to be a $20 million cost to uh, the taxpayer because um, we're reducing the tariffs on some goods coming into New Zealand. Um, so that's a $20 million revenue loss for New Zealand. Um, and Pharmac is going to have some um, minor administrative changes um, that will uh, cost them about $4.5 million. It's a one-off cost and there's a small $2 million um, cost uh, for them to administer that. But the big question that we all faced whilst TPP was being negotiated about the fundamentals about Pharmac, that's our drug buying agency, whether or not that would change and whether the cost of medicines would increase rapidly. Um, the answer to that is no, um, Pharmac is staying in place and we're not having to see huge costs for medicines going through the roof. So just on that basis alone, I hope that we can demonstrate that um, with a quarter of a billion dollars worth of tariffs that we save as a country and only $20 million in lost revenue, just on a pure tariff basis, we're winning considerably uh, under TPP. And an extra $2.7 billion a year in GDP growth is very good for New Zealand uh, as well. This um, table here 
just shows you um, which sectors in New Zealand are the biggest winners um, under TPP. And that, two, that quarter of a billion dollar figure that I mentioned before in tariff savings, how that plays out across the sectors. Now, we've been criticised quite a bit about the dairy industry um, on the basis that we didn't get a full comprehensive um, dairy um, tariff reduction as we would have liked. And the answer is yes, we would have liked to give, have got more for dairy under TPP. But dairy is one of the most protected industries around the world. And Canadian farmers and US farmers have a lot of influence um, in their countries. But the single biggest um, winner under TPP within New Zealand is in fact the dairy sector. Of the $274 million in tariff saved overall, dairy uh, has a $96 million tariff saving. Despite the fact that dairy hasn't done as well as we would have liked, they still have the biggest tariff reductions under TPP and they are the biggest winner out of TPP within New Zealand. So I just want to answer a few of the common questions that you might have or may have heard in the media around TPP. Um, some of them are very unfounded and some of them I hope that I can answer uh, well for you here today. So the first question is, will New Zealand's sovereignty be lost? Will the New Zealand Parliament be dictated to by big foreign corporations? That's the line that a number of our political opponents um, have been uh, running. When they talk about sovereignty and when they talk about corporations influencing government decisions, what they're referring to is something called investor state dispute settlement. That effectively is when an investor is able to sue a foreign government for a loss of um, uh, assets or for a loss of uh, revenue where an, a foreign government has made a decision which impacts them negatively. The reason why it's in trade agreements is so that investors, when they're making investment decisions in a foreign country, they can have certainty uh, as to um, the regulatory environment that they're working in and certainty that their assets aren't going to be expropriated. ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement, allows them to sue the government where there have been losses. And there have been some countries that have been sued successfully um, by, by foreign corporations. Typically though, those have been situations where a foreign company, foreign country, has gone and expropriated, um, legislated to take away the assets of a company, or they've taken away a right that existed uh, within that company. So when you go through the list of all the decisions that have gone against governments, they've typically been in countries like South America or Africa, there have typically been situations where a foreign government said, you've got a nice coal mine there, we'd like to take that away from you, or you've got a nice contract there to get revenue from a bridge that you built, we'd like to take that away from you. Countries like New Zealand uh, and the United States that have um, good quality regulatory environments, um, they don't typically get challenged and they don't typically lose. New Zealand has uh, had free trade agreements with ISDS in it for a number of decades. We've never been challenged, and because we've never been challenged, we've never lost a case as well. But even though we have a good track record in New Zealand of having never been challenged and never having lost a case, um, we do have a number of safeguards in TPP to ensure that we can still regulate in the public interest. We want to know that as a government we can still regulate for health policy reasons or for environmental reasons and not be subject um, to challenge by foreign companies. And TPP outlines a number of exclusions to ISDS whereby a country, a company, cannot sue the New Zealand government if we're making decisions uh, that's pursuing um, health benefits or where we're pursuing um, uh, uh, environmental uh, benefits for the country, even if they do have losses under regulations or rules that we pass, they're not able to sue us under ISDS because of specific exclusions. TPP also doesn't restrict the New Zealand Parliament. The New Zealand Parliament will remain sovereign, um, the New Zealand Parliament can't be restricted um, and even if we do things that investors uh, don't agree with, um, they have the right to challenge us but they don't have the right to change any policies uh, in New Zealand. So we think with those specific safeguards written into TPP around ISDS, we're actually relatively um, safe. And then, I, I, I've just covered it uh, in what I was saying, but for health or social service or environmental or tax reasons, we'll still be able to legislate um, for legitimate public policy reasons 
and we cannot be um, challenged under it. Around the world, there are 3,000 trade agreements where ISDS provisions are in place. Across the world, though, countries have only lost 116 cases out of all of the trade agreements that are in place. Countries typically win. The arguments that you may have heard in the media that big foreign corporations are going to come and dictate policy to New Zealand are unfounded and false, and that cannot happen uh, given the safeguards that we have in place. The other argument you may have heard against TPP is that the cost of medicines are going to rapidly increase. The answer to that is that's not going to change, that's not going to happen, because whilst the United States government wanted us to completely change the way in which we buy drugs as a country, um, they wanted us to move away from the model we have where one agency purchases all of the drugs um, for New Zealand and then sells them, on sells them to hospitals and on sells them to doctors. Um, we argued that we should maintain that uh, and that should stay in place and as a result um, we, our drugs will not end up costing uh, huge amounts more as was predicted by some opponents to TPP. As I mentioned earlier, there's some transparency changes Pharmac has to make and there's some small costs for them to become more transparent around their decision making, but the overall cost of medicines won't rapidly increase. We've also been criticised about the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, a number of iwi interests don't believe we've done enough to protect the Treaty of Waitangi. New Zealand is the only country under TPP that has a specific exclusion which allows us to make laws, regulate, uh, pursuing um, goals under the Treaty of Waitangi and not have those challenged. Um, we're the only country under TPP that has a specific exclusion for our Indigenous people and, and Treaty of Waitangi um, decisions will not be able to be challenged under TPP. The f question of foreign house purchases also comes up under TPP. Um, there are a number of groups that believe that we should be restricting um, those that are overseas buyers that wish to purchase houses in New Zealand. And they criticise us for not having a specific um, exclusion allowing us to ban foreigners um, buying houses under TPP. The answer to that is it's true. Um, TPP, we will not be able to um, ban foreigners from TPP countries from buying houses in New Zealand if a future New Zealand government wants to be able to do that um, because it would be seen as discriminatory against TPP um, countries compared to our domestic purchases. But what we are still able to do under TPP is put in place um, taxes which would be um, discriminatory against foreign buyers and those taxes uh, we could implement in such a way in which it would have the effect of effectively banning them because it would become so difficult for them to purchase property in the future if they wanted to. A future New Zealand government may wish to do that. Um, it's not currently the policy that the current government is pursuing, but there will still be that ability to restrict foreigners through the tax system when it comes to purchasing houses in the future uh, if we wanted to. So overall, TPP... Um, reduces the barriers to trade for New Zealand exporters. It will lead to a significant tariff reductions for New Zealand exporters. It'll be worth uh, $2.5 billion to the New Zealand economy once it's fully implemented. And our track record of free trade agreements shows us that where we have good quality free trade agreements, we see more exports, we see more money flowing into New Zealand, we see our economy growing faster because of those free trade agreements and ultimately that means more jobs for New Zealanders and higher wages for New Zealanders. That's why we believe TPP is important and that's why we've been pursuing um, TPP um, for a number of years now. Both Labour and national governments have been pursuing TPP and fortunately uh, it's finally at the point where countries are going through the ratification process. But that leads us to the question of the United States. And that leads us to the question of um, whether TPP will actually get ratified across all of the nations. And the question I often get asked is, um, will, can TPP um, continue and go through if the United States isn't part of it? And will the United States actually um, join up to TPP? Uh, the, first, the answer to the first question is, um, there's a certain threshold that, that has to be met before TPP 
um, is ratified fully and fully implemented. And that requires countries making up 85% of all of the um, GDP within TPP countries. 85% or, uh, countries to the value of 85% have to sign up to it and ratify it. Um, the United States, if they uh, walk away from it, unfortunately that will mean TPP um, won't be able to go ahead. Is the United States going to walk away from it though? And um, that's kind of a how long's a piece of string um, question. But when you see in the media that both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are opposed to TPP, you have to remind yourselves that in the United States, they're very different to New Zealand in terms of what happens after an election. Here in New Zealand, once we have an election, uh, we can't pass laws in the parliament until the new government comes into place. They're quite different in New Zealand. They have a two-month period between November and January where, despite the fact they've had an election, even if a president or members of their Congress are kicked out of office, they can still um, legislate, and they do do this um, with quite a lot of vigour um, every time they have an election. They call it the lame duck session of Congress, and they continue to legislate. All of the experts that are following TPP and the United States are suggesting that um, if the United States does end up ratifying TPP, it'll likely be in the lame duck session. After the election, once the circus is over, to, to use Rob's um, comments, um, and after the, the point in which representatives um, will be held accountable at the next election um, by the people. It sounds somewhat anti-democratic, um, but it's the way the United States works and it's possible under their constitution. But I was lucky enough to um, visit the US, as Rob was mentioning um, just recently, and uh, uh, I can just take you a few few travel picks um, if you like, but I was fortunate enough to visit both the Republican um, National uh, Convention and the Democratic uh, National Convention. That's me there outside the front of the uh, Cleveland Convention. Um, this gentleman is Todd Muller, he's a Member of Parliament from Bay of Plenty. Um, we went with the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff and a number of National Party board members. This gentleman here is Tim Grosser, he's our um, Ambassador uh, in the United States uh, as well. The thing about these conventions is they are huge. We just don't understand in New Zealand what politics in the United States is like. For the Cleveland Republican Convention, they saw 50,000 people flood their city um, for a whole week. 20,000 of them were delegates and observers in these uh, benches here. And then they had media, they had security, um, they had people that were there as lobbyists that were there to support what was going on at the convention but not even go themselves. It was, it's a huge event, it's, it's like a mini Olympics um, for a city when they have a convention uh, like this. This is a shot of um, the whole Cleveland Convention Centre. Um, we had some seats right up the back, right up the top. Um, and the gentleman speaking right now is Scott Walker, who uh, is the governor of Wisconsin, who was a, pre a losing presidential candidate. He's speaking um, at this moment. But, but that shot, hopefully, can give you an idea of just how many people um, go to these conventions. One of the real things we noticed about um, US politics and these conventions is just how um, polarised their country is. If we think of the New Zealand extremes in politics like this, the US extremes are, are like this. They are well um, to the left and right um, in, a, in a way in which we just don't understand uh, in New Zealand. We were pretty taken aback at just how vicious it gets as well. Um, it was very common for people on the floor of the convention to be chanting about Hillary Clinton, lock her up, lock her up, she's a criminal, she's a criminal. We just don't do that in New Zealand and we just don't understand um, how politics can get so vicious in a country uh, like this. But it was a great opportunity to both view American politics but also build a number of uh, relationships as well. And um, alongside all of the um, convention activities that take place within the convention hall, there's also heaps of activities that take place um, after the convention finishes, uh, usually at 11 or midnight, 11 o'clock at night or midnight. Uh, and so after the convention finished, we were able to go to a number of events and a number of parties uh, where you see members of Congress, where you see important politicians in their country, and we're able to um, walk in and, and meet a gentleman called Paul Ryan, um, who is the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives.
representatives. He's effectively the top ranking Republican in the United States uh, right now. He's a really interesting individual because um, he's got a difficult, extremely difficult political um, job to do right now because he has to walk a tightrope of uh, ensuring that the Republican Party remains credible enough in the eyes of the public so they can get uh, members of Congress re-elected, so governors and senators running for re-election don't lose their races. But he also has to um, be uh, on that tightrope in such a way that he doesn't end up attacking or dumping on Donald Trump as well. Donald Trump is very erratic. Um, Donald Trump uh, has some very extreme views um, that are unpalatable to people like us here in New Zealand. But uh, unfortunately, he seems to have quite a bit of support and following uh, in the United States. Um, the Republican Party establishment, though, is very concerned about um, what his behaviour and what his policies will do for their wider party. So this gentleman here, Paul Ryan, um, despite the fact he's probably unknown to 99% um, of New Zealanders, um, he has one of the biggest jobs of any Republican member of Congress in the whole country. He's the leader of their party in the Congress, um, and he's going to either be cleaning up the mess after the election, if it all turns to custard for them, them, or he's going to have to work out how in goodness name can they actually govern a country um, with Donald Trump as president. So he's an impressive guy. I also managed to meet a guy called Steve Scalise. I'm currently the government whip uh, in the parliament. Um, we don't literally um, whip MPs, but sometimes you'd like to. But we're sort of team managers. We, we support the MPs. We help to manage the party within the parliament. Um, he's effectively my equivalent in the US House of Representatives. The difference with their Congress is members of Congress get a free vote on just about anything and everything that they want. It's very rare that they do vote uh, as a collective. So every single vote that they do in the Congress, or they take in the Congress, um, someone like him and his deputies, they have to get alongside members, they have to cajole them to vote the right way, they have to try and find ways in which they can influence them on how to vote. Um, here in New Zealand, um, our, our system, our party system, uh, means that MPs typically vote along party lines in a very different way than they do in the United States. I put this photo up as well. Um, it looks, uh, it's very green, and the reason why it's green is because this gentleman is John Boehner. He was the former Speaker of the United States um, House of Representatives. He's a huge smoker. Um, the only place you could find him at the convention was in the smoking room. Um, you, you, obviously, you're not allowed to smoke inside the convention centre, but if you went and ventured out to the smoking room, you could find John Boehner, the former United States um, uh, House of Representatives Speaker. Uh, previously a very influential man, um, currently uh, no longer involved in politics, but loved by the Republican Party and those that follow. And that gentleman again is um, uh, Wayne Eagleson, John Key's uh, Chief of Staff. This is just a picture of us, uh, the New Zealand uh, MPs and Chief of Staff and the um uh, one of the uh, lake fronts uh, in Cleveland after we were having uh, a dinner with some uh, they were tobacco lobbyists actually um, not the type of people I'd typically be hanging out with but they um, they were friends of uh, personal friends of Wayne outside of the tobacco industry and he offered us some dinner and we got a nice shot on the riverfront there. As well as the Republican convention, we managed to go to the Democratic convention, and this is uh, my colleague Todd out the front of the Democratic convention. There was a very different um, kettle of fish. Whereas the Republicans were um, uh, typically uh, uh, white and grumpy and old and, and not particularly representative of um, the United States, the Democrats were very diverse. The Democrats were um, very representative of uh, modern day America. They were positive, they weren't um, negative like Donald Trump's Republicans were, uh, and they were quite aspirational about the future. It was a huge contrast um, and a pleasant one to see as well. The Democrats had their problems though, uh, just like the Republicans do. Whilst the Republicans uh, are in chaos at the moment, they don't know which direction their party's going in with Donald Trump, the Democrats have a problem where the Bernie Sanders Democrats uh, and the Hillary Clinton Democrats just don't get along, they're not united, and they're not all paddling in the right direction. The Democratic Party uh, has a very good chance of holding on to the White House this election cycle, but the problem for the Democrats is a whole range of Bernie Sanders um, supporters won't support Hillary Clinton. 
the whole lot of Bernie Sanders supporters probably won't bother going out and voting, or if they do, they'll vote for the Green Party candidate. So despite the fact the Democrats um, did put on a good convention, it was very Hollywood focused, it was very aspirational and positive as I was saying, bubbling beneath the surface that you didn't see in the TV cameras uh, was the divisions and the um, dislike of Hillary Clinton that the Bernie Sanders supporters have. And you might think it's only a small portion of Democratic voters. It's actually quite a large number of them because Bernie Sanders was growing a huge amount of support the longer he went on. If he had another six months, um, there's a good chance he might have overcome um, Hillary Clinton. One of my highlights of the convention, though, was being able to listen to Bill Clinton um, from the floor of the convention. Typically you can't go onto the floor of the convention. That's where the delegates sit, that's where they vote, that's where they conduct their business from the floor of the convention. But we were, uh, good thing about a New Zealand accent is um, we're very much liked around the world. Um, people like listening to us and uh, with a bit of charm and a New Zealand accent you can usually um, sneak your way into places more so than you otherwise could within our own country. So um, with a bit of charm and a New Zealand accent, uh, myself and Todd Muller we managed to sneak, not sneak, we managed to get access um, to the floor of the convention on the night that Bill Clinton uh, was speaking. You can't really tell the distance here, but, but the distance between where I'm sitting and where Bill Clinton is speaking from is only about 20, 25 metres. And um, I don't think I'll ever come that close to a US president uh, ever again, uh, certainly not for a long time. But that guy's a master. Just the way he could speak, the way he used his hands, um, the style that he, that he used in, in his speaking, um, it was great to see and it was brilliant. Also was lucky to meet Madeleine Albright, the uh, Secretary of, former Secretary of State under Bill Clinton. Um, she was leading a program in foreign policy that we're able to um, sit in on and uh, watch and have a chat to her as well. You probably don't realise that she's so tiny, um, but she's very, very small. I mean, I'm a big guy, but um, most, most women don't, <laughs> aren't, aren't that short uh, next to me, but she's incredibly intelligent and a wonderful woman. And um, this is just a fun one around, around uh, Philadelphia where the um, Democratic Convention was. They, they had all these elephants, they, they had all these um, donkeys around the city, um, 50 of them based on the number of, based on the states and, and where they're from. And there was a bit of fun looking for them uh, as well. Overall impressions of the United States are they do politics in a huge way that we just won't understand. They're very um, diverse and, and uh, very fractured as a country and uh, I hope that we get a good result that's good for the world, which is Hillary Clinton. Um, but even though Donald Trump is quite distasteful and his views um, do not sit anywhere uh, within New Zealand politics, he actually has quite a bit of support out there. He actually does have quite a following. And with both of them being very unpopular, with both of them um, having, having very high negatives in the polls, the question about who's going to win is probably going to come down to turnout, who bothers to vote, how they vote, and if they bother to vote uh, for their own um, party nominees or whether they go to a third party like the Greens or whether they go to the Libertarians. But uh, an amazing experience that I um, may not get to repeat ever again, um, but loved it entirely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to take questions if you want. Questions for Jamie Lee. Ted. Yeah. So you mentioned um, the original TPP, there were four partners. Who were the four? Um, let's just go back to this. Can we do that? Off the top of my head, it was. Uh, so it was, it was uh, New, New Zealand. What's that? No, New Zealand, um, Chile, Brunei, uh, I'm going to say Singapore. Yeah, Singapore, Brunei, New Zealand and Chile. Yeah. They're the P4. Yep. Ian. Yeah, hi Jamie Lee. As one who's actually shaken Bill Clinton's hand. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh. oh. I've only been 25 metres away. Well, I was a bit concerned because I knew we were to be earlier, but uh, <laughs> not apart from that. Um, you've allayed some of my concerns tonight, although I'm still a little bit confused and confused about the, the TPP. Sure. A lot of commentators say the major reason for us being part of the TPP is because we can't afford not to be. Yeah. And I wonder sometimes if that's the right reason to be part of it. Um, 
I was concerned about um, the, the issue of uh, people from overseas being able to buy freely housed in New Zealand when we have a housing, what, what some of us would say a housing crisis at the moment, although I, I would say politicians say we don't have a housing crisis at the moment. But you say that uh, the taxation can be put on that to allay that. I was concerned about the issue of sovereignty also. My understanding um, a little bit is that there's something like 29 or 30 chapters in the TPP, but only five of them talk about uh, trade. All the others talk about um, policies and political issues. And I still have real concern about the sovereignty issue. For example, if the government or, or if the voters decided a company like Coca-Cola that excess sugar and products and we as a country wanted to do something to reduce that, and we decided to do that, um, you have addressed that to an issue, but I'm not sure 100% whether Coca-Cola or light companies could not still take a class action, or a, not a class action, but a case against the New Zealand government. Um, I, I feel we have been asked to take a lot on faith, trust us, we know what we're doing, and there's still a little bit of, we went through this, it sounds, sounds really good. So maybe w would the best would the best case scenario for New Zealand to be that either, well, it's likely to be either Trump or Hillary, gets elected into the White House, both of them cut the free trade agreement, or both of them cut TPP, so it's, it's a dead issue, and then New Zealand gets onto the business of negotiating mm -hmm. its own free trade agreements with individual countries, as it's done very successfully in the past. Um, there's a range of issues there. With the last one, uh, yes, it's possible to... That was the question. Yes. <laughs> that was the question. The last one. The last one. So a bilateral trade agreement is better than multi-nation trade agreements was, was your last question. And um, typically that's been the case. And we're able to do that on, on, with a range of countries and we've demonstrated that. The problem when you get to the big ones like the US and Japan, uh, and, and arguably this could be the case with the United Kingdom, given we'll have to negotiate with them individually now, uh, is we, we're small and insignificant to them. They are large countries um, that want to do trade agreements with other large nations, and we try where we can to push for bilateral trade agreements, but they're not always interested. The, the beauty for New Zealand is that we're able to um, tack on to multi-nation trade agreements like TPP and get the benefits of it by being one of a number of nations that are there. Um, there's nothing to say that the US would do a bilateral trade agreement with the United S with, with New Zealand um, if there weren't other nations involved and they're interested in getting into a number of other nations as well. The US has also been pursuing TPP from a strategic perspective as well. China's quite effectively going around the Pacific um, doing trade agreements one-on-one -on -one with other countries also using their aid budget to gain influence with nations around the Pacific, and one of the rationale, one of the reasons why the U.S. and Barack Obama have been pursuing TPP is because um, they want to get into the trade space with those South Pacific nations to um, get back some of the influence that they're losing um, to China. Uh, Multi-nation trade agreements are it's sort of the new way of doing uh, trade agreements, and for us to get through the door of those big nations like the US and Japan, um, we almost certainly have to be part of a multi-nation trade agreement. Should TPP fail, um, there's uh, also negotiations underway for a trade agreement called RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It's another trade agreement, almost uh, the same as TPP, except it involves China and doesn't involve uh, the United States. But Japan's involved there, I believe, and that would assist us on that basis. But again, it's a multi-nation trade agreement. Should trade agreements just be based on trade or should they have other rules in place uh, as well? The reality of the current world is that uh, many nations, particularly the big ones, they're concerned about investment and they're concerned about how their own people um, are able to invest in other nations. And that's why um, a range of other rules sit alongside the trade agreement um, inside the agreement itself. Um, rules around investment, uh, rules around um, 
uh, biologics and copyright with medicines, uh, rules around um, how particular industries um, can be regulated in a particular country. Um, they won't do trade agreements without those rules in place. And if we want to get um, additional exports into those countries, um, we have to be open-minded towards that. The good thing about TPP though is we don't actually see many domestic changes um, needing to be made under TPP. There were a range of areas which they're not particularly sexy to talk about, but we pushed back on in a big way and have saved uh, New Zealand potentially uh, billions of dollars in the future. Uh, they typically revolve around drugs and how you buy them and also the, um, the intellectual property protection periods um, that are in place. When it comes to the, if I can, um, if I can cover the other points um, that you made as well. When it comes to foreign buyers of uh, property, yeah, we've got a big political debate in the moment around housing and around foreign buyers. And um, I won't tell you it's not a problem or it is a problem. I'll just give you this number to think about. We were criticised um, uh, a couple of years ago for not having good quality data around the number of foreigners buying houses in New Zealand. Um, those who want to restrict foreigners um, say that we've got a huge problem. Those that don't would say that there's not a problem. So we changed the law so that every property transfer that takes place in New Zealand um, goes through as uh, and goes on a register um, operated by the government, Land Information New Zealand. Um, we're now getting data coming out of those rule changes we made last year. Uh, in the first three months of this year, um, we were able to see through that data that we collected that 4% of all properties purchased in New Zealand, uh, in Auckland, uh, were purchased by those living offshore with a overseas tax residency. Uh, the last month, uh, sorry, today, um, the last three months data has just come out and it shows that there's 5% of all property purchases in Auckland are being purchased by people with an overseas um, tax residency. When you look at the property transfers, those that are sold and those that are purchased, 3% across the whole country of property transfer transfers uh, uh, involving purchases with overseas tax residency, but interestingly, it also involves 3% of sellers with overseas tax residency. So we can make conclusions as a government about that, and, and so can you, but I'll just leave those numbers with you. 3% across the whole country are involving overseas buyers, 5% uh, in Auckland. Um, we think it's relatively small, and should it um, ramp up considerably more, then we can take action against it. But does TPP stop us from taking action? Yes, it will stop us from banning people who are purchasing um, properties because we can't discriminate against them under TPP, but the taxes you can put in place um, would have exactly uh, the same effect, uh, essentially. You also are rightly concerned about investment and about the ability for New Zealand to make um, policy decisions. Could we stop Coca-Cola from putting sugar in Coca-Cola if we wanted to? Um, if we are able to demonstrate that we're pursuing a health outcome for New Zealand, the specific exclusions in TPP where foreign corporations are excluded from suing us, from taking action under the Investor State Dispute Settlement Clauses, uh, should we be able to demonstrate it's for health reasons that we're pursuing that policy, then they're not able to um, challenge us under ISDS. ISDS isn't new. It's, it's been around for decades. There are 3,000 agreements around the world where ISDS is included. Um, we've got trade agreements where ISDS is, is, is in place as well. Provided your country um, doesn't pursue uh, the practice of expropriating assets, provided we don't say to foreign companies, we like your asset that you have over there, we're going to take it for us, for the government to operate, provided we don't say, you know, you've got rights that are existing and we're going to take them away from you without compensating you, provided you don't do that, you have nothing to worry about. There are additional safeguards though around health benefits, environmental benefits that are there for additional protection, but should we um, have good stable government like we've had for many, many years, um, we shouldn't have to worry about anything at all. Is there a risk? Yeah, there's a risk, um, but the bigger risk we believe is not being involved in a trade agreement which sees our trading partners going off, seeing their exports rapidly increasing, or our exporters continue to pay high tariffs which are detrimental to us. It's not just the lost opportunity in the future um, which 
uh, is a risk for us. It's also the risk of um, our exports reducing in New Zealand if we're not part of it, because another country like Australia um, gets the benefits of reduced trade barriers uh, and we don't, and our exporters lose ultimately. Long answer, I'm sorry, but you had a long question. Um, last question, seeing as Ian asked so many. <laughs> yeah, he did, and I think you've answered it. Yep. The ISDS provisions of the TPP agreement are the same or similar to our other agreements? Question one. Question two is an altruistic one. There's a lot of people in the world who are against TPP and are against free trade. Would you like to comment on how many people have come out of poverty as a result of free trade? Um, very similar. The ISDS provisions in TPP are, are very similar. Arguably, their protections are strengthened um, because, you know, it's like anything you do in life. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, countries are getting better at putting in place um, safeguards to protect domestic regulatory powers. And uh, with TPP, we've gone as far as to specifically say anything to do with tobacco, um, doesn't matter what the policy you're pursuing is, whether you are doing it for health reasons or you just don't like tobacco companies, anything to do with tobacco, um, you can um, throw, throw any challenges out the door. It's very common in trade agreements now. If we didn't accept ISDS, we wouldn't do any trade agreements. It's involved in the China one too, by the way, and we've um, grown uh, rapidly. On the, uh, the second question, I don't have any stats off the top of my head, but um, uh, would like to take the view. Uh, no, no, it, it, is, it is, I believe, common economic uh, uh, um, you know, theory that trade agreements uh, lead to an increase in trade, which leads to more money flowing into countries, which leads to more people um, being able to create jobs, which leads to more people getting jobs. And the more that you uh, reduce unemployment, the more that you get people off the dole queue and into work, um, the, the healthier and more prosperous their life is. And um, TPP is not going to solve poverty in a particular country. But everything you do, which is aimed towards getting more people into work and getting more jobs created in the economy, that's good for the. Eight billion. Eight, eight billion? Yes. All right, there you go. You should have just said that at the start. Thank you.